Hey, welcome back everyone to the On Track Podcast. Thanks for being here as always. So today, uh, as usual, we have an amazing show that is going to give you guys a possible huge missing piece of your puzzle when it comes to losing weight and just optimizing your overall health and something that you would definitely not think has such a big impact on it. So stay tuned for that. First though, I want to tell you guys about my upcoming intro to keto course that's happening again. So this is the I want to say the fourth or fifth one now that we've run. They're always a huge success. And this year's 2019, we have revamped the course and have made it all about ketogenic diet and female hormones. So we are taking it up a notch. It's going to be a 21 day rather than a 14 day that we did in the past. It'll be a 21 day intro to keto for women's hormone health. So what does this consist of? If you have been following a ketogenic diet or you've been interested in trying the ketogenic diet, you are between the ages of, you know, 35, 38 to about six and you are feeling the effects of your hormones changing, then this is for you. Okay. So this is super specific because this, I'm telling you ladies, is not out there and it is so needed. The ketogenic diet is one of the most powerful and growing diets in North America, the fastest growing diets in North America right now. So it is super powerful. However, if you are experiencing hormonal dysfunction, nine out of 10 women changing your diet is not enough to lose the weight. You may lose some initial pounds, but I find after that, and this is working with thousands of women, that after that, things tend to plateau or maybe you'll lose weight for a few months and then it'll plateau because your hormones are still out of balance. And the keto diet is amazing to help the body to rebalance hormones, but it's just not enough in most cases. So this 21 day intro to keto for women's hormone health is going to include an introduction to the ketogenic diet for those that are new to it. So you're going to get my uh, my introduction to keto ebook. We're just going to tell you all about the keto diet. We're going to do a one week keto induction meal plan that's going to lower the carb count slowly so that you don't have too much of a shock to your system. And then it's going to go into a traditional low carb ketogenic diet for the, for the final two weeks. And during these three weeks, we are going to each week have a coaching call where I am going to bring you through exactly how to identify what hormones could be impacting your ability to lose weight as well. Just feel amazing and, you know, have the good skin and the clear head and all of these things that start to go as we age, I am going to help you identify which ones are out of balance, both with what lab work to get, what you can ask your doctor for, what you may need to be paying out of pocket for, as well, what you can do just simply from home, from I'm going to give you guys my ultimate hormone questionnaire so you can even just help identify which hormones could be causing problems just by taking this questionnaire, uh, how to identify whether or not your thyroid could be a problem. As we age, we tend to have a thyroid that starts to go down because of the hormone, the other hormones and what they're doing. So we see a lot of women developing hypothyroidism as they get to this age. So we're, I'm going to tell you how to identify whether or not there could be a thyroid issue or a metabolism issue from the comforts of your own home. So this is huge. And then how to apply the ketogenic diet, depending on what your hormone results are, how to go about tweaking that keto diet in order to optimize those hormones that may be having problems. Because unfortunately, if there is a thyroid problem, if there's an adrenal problem, so if the cortisol problem is, is a problem, then you are going to have to apply a different kind of ketogenic diet to suit your specific health needs. And I'm going to walk you through all of that in this upcoming course. 
The course will run from February 18th to March 10th. You're going to get four information packed videos in those in that three weeks, including Q and A. So you're going to have a chance to ask me questions um, and get really fine tuned on exactly how to apply the keto diet and, and the hormone health information to you specifically. You're going to get my keto startup ebook with everything you know, everything you need to know on how to get started on the right foot. You're going to get the ultimate hormone questionnaire to help you discover which hormones are out of balance, four information-packed live videos on the basics of the ketogenic diet and how to balance your hormones for optimal weight loss results, supplement recommendations for hormone health, what labs are best to determine the state of your hormones, how to properly test your thyroid and how to test your thyroid from home with no lab work, as mentioned how to modify the ketogenic diet when you have a compromise when you have compromised adrenals so it's stress how to bust through weight loss plateaus on the keto diet the three key factors every woman needs to address for the ultimate success on the keto diet and how to safely use fasting to help you reverse insulin resistance and optimize your weight loss results as well you're going to have access to a private facebook group for support of course right uh, and all of this right now is included in a one-time fee that is right now 50% off. So I, I want to gather the masses for this one. So I, for a period of time, I am offering this at 50% off. Regular price is $70 for the course. So you can get this right now for $35. So underneath this, this, this video or the podcast, if you're listening to it through podcast, you will see the link to go and get it now and get on board for 50% off price for a limited time. So hop to it, check it out. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask as always. Karen at karenmartel.com is the email. So come on ladies, let's do this and we're going to do this right. And you're going to get so much out of this course uh, that you're not going to get anywhere else, which is pretty cool. So if you, like I said, have questions, reach out to me. So now for today's show, my big, the, the big secret weapon that you guys all need to hear about is actually from my friend, Scott Patton, who is a biomedical student over at the Wa University of Waterloo. He is a performance uh, expert. He's, oh, what is he? He's got a whole list of like amazing credentials behind him. But basically, he's a little smarty pants when it comes to how the body works and all about how to optimize our health on a, on a daily basis by going back to the way we would have lived millions of years. For, we would have lived for millions of years, but millions of years ago, probably. We would have, we would have lived this way. So you got to, you got to tune into this one. You got to, you got to put on the thinking cap because some of it's kind of deep. It's a little bit sciencey, but he's going to go and explain to us how all of our, you know, the artificial lights in our environment are impacting our health and how we can go about minimizing that impact that it's having on, on us by these really simple tools that you can use every day that I really truly believe can have a massive impact on your weight loss results because of what it's doing to your hormones, ladies. It's all about the hormones. You know that. So what is the artificial light doing to our hormones? What is it doing to our cortisol levels? How is it and then how is that impacting our thyroid? So all of these things uh, I see every day in my practice and who knew that it could very likely all be from the light that's in our environment. And there's other things too. We're going to touch in on, you know, the importance of your skin, the gut, the nutrition, things like that. Like he's got kind of a system of here's what you have to um, pay attention to in order to optimize your health, optimize your performance and your weight loss. So enjoy the show. <laughs> All right. So welcome, Scott Patton. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be on here. 
I know you're like nobody else I've ever had on here before. And what we're going to talk about, <laughs> I have to admit, is something that I've kind of deci- I decided a few years ago to put on the back burner because I was like, oh God, I don't want to go down this road quite yet. I don't want to know about some of this stuff quite yet and what it's doing to my health just because I just didn't want another thing to be worried about when it comes to my health. And I realized, you know, especially since talking to you um, a few weeks ago, I was like, oh my gosh, this is something that I can't ignore anymore and that my listeners need to know about. So let's just start. I want to know like, what you do, I know you're in school, you're smarty pants, but you've got a serious passion for optimizing somebody's health. And so just give us a little background about what you do and in, in the program that you created called Daily Optimization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so myself right now, I'm a student at the University of Waterloo uh, at biomedical science, um, a little bit of dabbling kind of in neuroscience. And it really piggybacked off me playing hockey in Kelowna uh, that would have been a, a few years ago now. And at the time, you know, it was pretty serious hockey, and so I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, and because I was a goalie in hockey, a lot of my life had been kind of dedicated to performance. And, you know, as a goaltender, I'm a little biased because I was a goalie, but I found that um, it was probably one of the toughest positions in sports. There was just so much that could go wrong, and, you know, things were constantly on the kind of fine edge. So I kind of took it upon myself to try to find every single avenue or every single kind of tip or, or tool or a trick that I could do um, to really help myself perform. And as I slowly kind of morphed into hockey, my insatiable desire to kind of figure out what health means, kind of how it relates to ourselves, became less about performance and more about, um, you know, simply just kind of feeling good in a very practical sense. Um, you know, because health itself is it's kind of a weird term, and, and we talked about this last time we chatted, but there are a lot of, you know, a lot of words and terms and ideas that we throw around or when we talk about, we seem to understand when we say things like, you know, your potential or even stress or things like health. But when you actually think about what they, you know, what they mean, you know, take the word health, it can have a lot of different meanings or, you know, wear a lot of different masks. Sometimes you're very excited. Sometimes you're, you know, very relaxed and stress-free. And, um, you know, the fact that it covers such a broad kind of category, it's almost like you can, you know, dilute it into something that's like feeling good. It's a feeling that you want to feel. And so with me, you know, with my creation of a program called the Daily Optimization, you know, from my desire to learn about how I can constantly put myself in a state that I really like. And sometimes that means, you know, a state where I'm very energetic, you know, and excited. And other times it means being able to calm myself down. Uh, you know, what are the things that I can really control outside of me and inside of me, which are going to lead to the outcomes that I'm looking for? And, you know, life is very squirrely. There's a lot that's just kind of not under our control, especially in our bodies, a lot going on. You know, even think about the weather here in Ontario, it's just been kind of minus 20, minus 25. And expecting life to change around you, it just, you know, that's that's a fool's man game. And so for me, it was about, all right, what can I do and, and what can I think and feel and how can I act, which is going to lead to, you know, some of the outcomes and what can give me kind of a sense of control. And there are a lot of key players in my life that have kind of led to some of my ideas, and we'll talk about them, but, you know, some of the fundamental aspects of what we're exposed to, things like light. You know, things like um, even cold therapy, you can use that. Uh, meditation and kind of developing an awareness and some sort of command over your biology. Um, so that's kind of a long, convoluted answer to say that not only I'm a student, but I'm just I'm very curious and very passionate about really figuring out as human beings, you know, what are the things that we can pay attention to and become aware of? Um, and then once we do kind of know what to pay attention to, then we know what to act on. And, you know, once we know how to act, how can we kind of develop our lives so that we're constantly getting the results, whether that be feeling good, just in a very basic sense, or in terms of productivity. Right. Yeah, you can tell you have a science background, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, science, science itself is, I mean, science is a question, it's not an answer. And, um, you know, one of the things with your listeners that I really want to get across is I don't want to give anyone answers, truly. What I'm hoping to do is inspire curiosity, because... Um, I mean, really good answers come from good questions. And the people that I really learned from, I think, are just people that ask really good questions and kind of really fundamental ones. So, you know, when we think of science, we often think of people in kind of white lab coats who are like really smart ones. But I think there's Einstein who said questions are more important than answers. And so just being really curious and in some sense aware, um, I think that's, you know, the most powerful kind of scientific mind that we all can develop. 
Yeah. And I, so I remember you saying to me, I thought this was really key was we tend to try to control our nutrition first and foremost, kind of overall before anything else when it comes to our health and what is, what's wrong with that paradigm? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's a half truth. And mm -hmm. um, Jack Cruz has played a really big influential um, part in my life. He likes to say that a half truth always leads to a full lie. And so in, you know, modern kind of North American 21st century um, society, we often hear that diet and exercise are the two things that you can do you know, to make it healthy. And that is absolutely true. I mean, what you're putting in your body in terms of food obviously plays a big role. You know, uh, in exercise, I would expand that to movement, how we move our body, you know, obviously incredibly important. But to stop there is just, with all due respect, ignorant. And so um, I haven't quite named it yet, but um, I might almost call it the surface theory. And so to think of, you know, when we talk about things like health, it has something to do with us being alive, right? When someone dies, you know, they're, they're not healthy, they're not living anymore. Um, and when we look at how to measure health, there are kind of two things that we look at right now. There's lifespan and health span. So there's, you know, the lifespan, like how long are you living for? And we generally think that people that are healthy will live longer. So that's kind of a quantity aspect. And then there's a health span. So it's like, you know, um, what's the quality of the life while you are living? And those two are kind of in, in balance. Um, and so to really think about that in kind of a concrete biological way, where we have an external environment and then we have an internal environment, which is us. And the way that we interact with our external environment mainly happens, you could say, at four surfaces. That's our eyes, that's our skin, that's our lungs, and it's our gut. So if you think about our eyes, right, our eyes interact with the light around us, and it is the main way that we interact with the external world. Um, about, they're differing numbers, but about 30 to 50% of the cortex, or kind of main part of your brain, is dedicated to vision. Um, you know, if you think about the kind of the main way that, um, like I said, you interact with the world, or, or what's the one sense that you probably couldn't live without? Most people would say, you know, sight. Mm -hmm. Right, it's it allows us to kind of have the most kind of complex interaction with this crazy environment. We're in. So we have our eyes, we have our skin, and that deals with light and deals with um, some other things like electromagnetic energy. But just on a very basis, you know, basic way, things like touch and light. We have our, our gut, which deals with the food, and then we have our lungs, which deals with the air that we breathe. So why is that important? Well, you know, as human beings, um, there is kind of the idea of evolution. And that is in a very simple way, um, you know, the environment isn't going to change for us. There's a lot of life on this planet. And so it's our kind of responsibility as a human species to constantly adapt and, um, you know, figure out a way to, to live in the environment. And obviously we're pretty good at it because we've been here for a while. And so about 6 million years ago, we diverged from, uh, you know, chimpanzees or, you know, the kind of monkeys. And for probably about the last 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 years, um, you know, humans, they kind of look like what we look like now. If you were to see a human from 50,000 or 100,000 years ago, they look pretty similar to kind of what we look like now. And so if you think about what throughout human evolution, let's call it 6 million years going really back to the beginning where humans really became their own thing. We look at human evolution in terms of light. We had a fairly stable light environment. That is the sun, right? The sun would come up throughout the day and it would go down at night. You know, it would come up throughout the day and down at night. And as uncertain as life is, if there's one thing that you can bond on, is that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. And, you know, it comes up, goes down, comes up, goes down. And so naturally, because we rely on light to see, and we rely on light to interact in our external environment, it kind of made sense that, well, when the sun is up, that's when we're going to be outside gathering our food, kind of going throughout life. But, uh, you know, we need to sleep as well. So we might as well do it when there isn't light, when it's dark outside. And so naturally, humans develop this rhythm where it's, you know, there's light, or it's not just humans, but all animals, but when there's light, that's when you interact with the world. When it's dark, that's when you sleep and recover. So for about six million years, it's been a very stable environment. Just six Here's million. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a long time. And it's, when you kind of break it down to like a calendar, if you think, you know, that's kind of goes all the way from January 1st to December 31st, but, you know, just right before midnight, if we're trying to put the six million years of human evolution kind of into a calendar, just before midnight, humans got really fancy and we thought what would happen if we started to create our own artificial sun and that's really what we did so um, I think it was in the late 1800s when we started to really develop the technology to create um, really powerful artificial suns 
And we now know these artificial suns as light bulbs or LEDs, mm -hmm. right? So essentially what we've created is alien or artificial suns and we can put them indoors so we don't have to go outside to see light, right? That's pretty cool. That's a really neat thing that, you know, we're able to do is that it's like every, pretty much every other species on earth has to play by nature's rules, but now we're kind of tweaking with nature's game. And so we're kind of creating our own little artificial environment. The problem is we're like, a, we're like a kid with a new toy and we haven't really thought about all the possible consequences of what happens with this new toy. We're just excited to play with it. With the sun, there's a spectrum which people are fairly familiar with. It's like the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And most people are probably familiar with the fact that different colors do different things with their body. And you, know, you probably know that ultraviolet light has to do with you tanning. Um, but perhaps what you're less familiar with is blue light. And some people are starting to become aware because they have iPhones and it turns it down at night. But um, one thing that's really important to realize is the sun is that which provides you know, light and all the power to everything on this planet, right? It's really here for everything to live. It's the life source of our planet and you know, kind of our, our solar system. These lights that we have created, we did not create for health. We created for convenience. So if you have an LED energy efficient bulb, what makes it energy efficient is that they took the colors of the rainbow and they just started subtracting colors that you don't have to pay for. So essentially what we've done is we've taken the sun and we've only chosen two main colors, that is mainly blue and a little bit of green, and we stripped out all the rest. There's no UV light and there's no infrared. So we don't have to quote unquote waste money on these lights. Now energy efficient is actually a misnomer because it's cost efficient, but it actually depletes your body of energy. And this takes a little bit of science to realize, but when you look at how the sun is set up, um, when you look at how the sun is set up, especially when the sun rises, there's always going to be equal amounts of blue and red light, right? There's, there's always a balance between those two and why? Because we're light beings, because we need light to see, as we see, you know, as we kind of went over, our eyes are the main way of interaction with our external environment. The blue light from the sun is what tells our body it's go time, you know, it's daytime. It's what turns on your body's internal clock, or your circadian rhythm. It interacts with something in the eye, and that tells our body, okay, it's daytime, it's time to go confident at work. So you can think of that as stimulating. The sun also gives us an equal amount of red light, and red light is energizing. Not only does the sun stimulate us to, here, go conquer the world, but it provides some energy as well. It makes you feel good. If you don't believe me, just think about how you feel when you watch a sunset. Probably mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. How do you feel when you sit around a campfire? Probably amazing. So it's a very kind of complicated thing that it does in your body with um, your mitochondria and with uh, water. And we can talk about that, but all you have to remember is that for 6 million years, we've been in the sun. And for 6 million years, we've been in equal balance of blue and red. Blue is stimulating. Red is energizing. Now, what have we done with our LED lights? And I'm talking your phone, your computer, probably the lights that you have above you right now. They're all blue and there's no red. So I encourage people to look up the spectrum of light that comes from this. So what does that mean? You're completely stimulated, but you're not energized. Here's the real problem. Oh, too. interesting. You're stimulated. Some people would say those, are the, those two are the same thing, stimulated and energized, but it's not. Absolutely not. And this is why when you drink a coffee, it feels good for a little bit. I'll actually use a better one, cocaine. This is why okay. when people do cocaine, they kind of get that big high and then they crash. And you get the big high and they crash. When people drink coffee, right? They're stimulated, but then they crash. It's, it's, like, it's like it turns you on, but then it doesn't supply the energy to kind of keep going. Yes. It would be like, uh, for an analogy, someone's screaming at you to do better, but not actually providing the instructions on how to do better. It's like, uh, oh my God, right. I want to do better, but you don't really have that substance. Right. So, the real problem with these things is not only does the blue light that we're stimulated and not necessarily energized, but we're stimulated all day long and all night long. So what's ironic about this is that some people might be watching this, you know, podcast, let's say 8 p.m. at night, and they look outside and it's dark outside. So for six million years, our body got used to, you know, stimulate, energize, recover, stimulate, energize, recover, a beautiful balance. But now the sun goes down, except what do they do? They look into an LED screen and it tells their body it's daytime, it's go again. Now the intensity of that light tells you what time of day it is, right? So it's, it goes some, something called, uh, excuse me, color temperature. And with the intensity of the light, it tells your body it's about 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Oh. So essentially what we're seeing is a 1 p.m. signal all day long. From immediately when you wake up and you check your email to right before you go to bed, you look into the sun telling your body it's 1 p.m. at night. 
do we think this has biological consequences? And, and this is where the idea about food being a half truth, or a half truth, which almost leads to a full lie. Yes, what we put in our bodies is important, obviously. But think about, let's say you eat a lot, you eat like five times a day, right? Five times a day, that's a lot. How about what you surround your body with 100% of the time while you're awake? You think that's playing a role in your biology. Now, there are some crazy people, I have sort of crazy in air quotes, that maybe 10, 15 years ago started to see some of the problems with this, that when we change this natural light spectrum that we live in, there are some devastating biological consequences. And there's nothing inherently bad about LEDs. It's just the fact that we got used to a light source for 6 million years, and now we're radically changing it. Right? We're not seeing the darkness. We're not getting the red. This is why people go and sit around a fire and go, oh, this is so amazing. This feels so good. Why there's the yeah. Right, there's a classic scene of being with your lover and staring into the sunset. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the idea of red is so ingrained in us. If you go back to Lion King in 1994, there's a scene in the movie that as soon as the sun rises, all of the animals stop what they're doing right away and immediately go to watch the sunrise. Like the sun was the original god, right? The rising sun. The right. Egyptians, they talked about it, and I forget um, what god it was, but it was like, you know, Seth was the god of darkness, and, you know, every morning, you know, the rising sun would be, would be like, that would be the conquering thing. The idea of the rising sun, right? It's red light. At night, it's red light. We're beings that are really made for this, right? Dancing around fires. We've done this for a long time. Yeah. And, so and this is all triggering hormones, isn't it? Like this has so much impact on the hormonal system. So yeah. I, I, do you know much about that? Like a, what it's doing to the cortisol levels and, you know, things like that? So let's tie it into a bigger story in context because... I think details are a little less important when we get really the story right. Mm -hmm. So if we think about it, our body is not random, right? It's absolutely infinitely chaotic and crazy. We have like 50 trillion human cells. Every single second, they do 100,000 things. So 50 trillion cells doing 100,000 things. But it all seems to work together pretty well, obviously. There's a reason that you and I can have this conversation, right? So there has to be something which gives it order and tells it what to do. So if you think about all your hormones, right, you might think about there are some things that you want to happen during the day when it's light outside, when it's time to live, and there's some things that you want to happen at nighttime, right, when it's time to relax, when it's time to recover. And you think about what's the difference between day and night? Well, it's the sun. You can think of the sun as nature's metronome. That's another Jack Cruz saying, which I think is a really good one. The idea that the way our body knows what to do, when to do, is how much light is outside. Right? Because we live in the light. But when there isn't light, it tells the body, oh, let's do other things now. So when you think about your hormones and what they do, what actually what turns them on in the morning is blue light. So blue light comes through the eye. That's what kicks on your pituitary gland and says, okay, you know, it's time to get going. Right? Because you know, there are certain things that you want at certain times of day. And when you're starting out in the morning and you want to go catch the food and you want to live, you want those hormones that are going to give you energy. You know, like the idea of cortisol and quote-unquote stress, um, you'll often hear terms like stress kills, stress is bad for you, you know, cortisol is this killer. That's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Stress is that which calls forth energy from you, okay? Mm -hmm. We have a beautiful balance in our body with the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. It's like, think of it as a stress and then relax. You need energy, then you store it up. And you need energy, then you store it up, right? You're just, it's a balance. But one inherently isn't bad. The problem is right now in the grander context is we're in a society that is constantly stimulating us, which means it's constantly calling forth energy, right? With that blue light that you're not only staring to directly in the morning, but at nighttime, you're constantly turning on your body saying, we need energy, we need energy, we need energy, we need energy, but we're stimulated, we're stimulated. And there's no real shut off. So when the idea about our hormones are kind of out of whack, mm -hmm. you have to think about it and kind of what it means in a grander context. It's like, it's not our hormones, it's ourselves that we're constantly being Constantly telling ourselves in our bodies to be on. To be on. So, yeah. what, exactly. And so you think of, you know, people's sleep quality. Or let's take something that, like melatonin, right? Melatonin gets con converted. Serotonin and melatonin, they kind of flip back and forth. Right? With melatonin, uh, basically no one in North American society really makes melatonin at night anymore. Right? We all know melatonin as it's a hormone of darkness. Right? So you're, the way that your body knows it's nighttime is through darkness. So what do you think the consequences of staring into the sun right before you go to bed are? It, it, like it's, it's, you're telling your body there's no need for melatonin because it's not nighttime. You're telling your body it's 1 p.m. in the afternoon right before you go to bed. And now 
because we're kind of in love with our own creation a little bit, because we're such intelligent beings right now when it comes like, especially in the scientific community, um, you know, we think that we can replace that with a melatonin supplement, but it's just, you know, we cannot outsmart nature, right? The way that our bodies are designed it to, I mean, the first of all, the fact that we've gotten here is a miracle. Like our bodies are so incredibly capable. I know. You know it's, it's phenomenal. And I think we all have an appreciation of that. But to think that we can stare into an artificial sun before bed, telling your body to one gem and take melatonin and think we're going to be okay. I mean, there are a lot smarter people which will outline the problems with that, but you just, you don't have to know the details of the problems if you understand the story. Like yeah. you have, so here, here, this kind of ties in a bigger concept, which I'm really interested in. So with our nervous system, we have a sympathetic and parasympathetic. And for most people that aren't quite familiar with physiology, the sympathetic aspect is, let's call it the stress, the stress and pause, the, you know, the, the fight and flight, right? It's what gives our body energy. And it doesn't matter what type of stress you encounter, whether it's a lion chasing you, someone with a knife, you get in a fight with your partner. Um, you see, you see, you see uh, a certain president of a country say something silly on TV and you kind of get annoyed and stressed doesn't matter what the kind of stimulus, if it's a stressful stimulus, all that means is it kicks forward energy in your body. All right. Now, we also have another system called the parasympathetic system. And most people know this as the rest and digest system. And essentially, the reason that we have this kind of balance between the two goes back to the symbol that was from, I don't know if it was long ago, but it plays a pretty big role. It's the yin yang symbol. The okay. chaos. Yeah. And really, all that really says is that with chaos is something like potential. And so when you think about what stress is, oftentimes we stress out about things that we, we, you know, are a little bit uncertain in our lives, right? It's like, think about you're walking down the street and it's really dark at night and you're not quite sure when you hear a sound. It's like, you're not quite sure about what's really going on in your external environment. And it's a little bit uncertain. And so what your body does is it fills your body with energy, right? It calls forth energy from your body. Now, when we get away, let's say, from that person who's going to stab us, and we finally get to relax, our body goes, okay, we no longer need energy, let's store up resources. So there's this beautiful system between calling forth energy from our body and then storing up resources and returning back to order. Think about what your doctor says, is your health in order, right? It's like that thing that we return back to. And we're constantly in this beautiful balance fluctuating back and forth. So really, any conversation that we have about health, or in something like light, is that is there a balance? Are we in order? And the answer is no. If you look at your email right as you get up and you look at your email right before you go to bed and you spend all day under these artificial lights staring into a screen, which is a sun, you literally stare into a sun all day. You're stimulated all day long and you simply have thrown your body out of order or out of balance. Yes. So I, that's, that's, it's a very kind of long description of it, but that's perfect. You know, it, it, it gets very deep, deep and dark in the details. And again, they're much more brilliant people than me that really can explain the details. But, um, you know, we have to just in a very simple concept, you know, we have to introduce that balance back into life. And, um, you know, there are many ways of doing that. But, you know, unfortunately, right now in society, especially in North American, you know, we value the go, go, go. And that can be a lot of fun. But as long as we're aware and responsible about how to manage that, I think there is a way to be healthy in North American society. But right now it's not being talked about. I completely agree. And I think, like I said, this is why I've kind of, I, I've ignored it for a while because it's like, <laughs> holy, this is overwhelming because I mean, I sit in front of a computer screen all day long, you know, and it's, yeah, I've got this big ring light staring at me when I'm doing my podcasts. So I'm constantly having that artificial lighting hitting me super hard. And I, you know, looking at this from a practitioner's viewpoint, which I deal with women and their hormones. Number one and foremost is I'm dealing with hormones. And across the board, I see dysfunction with women's cortisol levels. And this is so key for everyone listening to really get, because I talk to women all the time that say, but my, you know, I'll say, well, are you stressed out? 
and they'll say, no, I'm not. Like I, I'm retired, some of them, or, you know, I lived, I love my job. I had a woman just tell me that the other day. She's like, I love my job. I don't stress out. I love my family life. I've got a good relationship. I'm not stressed out. She went to the doctor, her cord, I got her, I got them to test her cortisol. It was so high. She's now been referred to a specialist because they couldn't, they, they think that there's something seriously wrong because her cortisol is so high. And, you know, this is, that's a bit of an extreme case. But what I'm seeing is either really high cortisol levels or way too low. And, you know, it's causing hype, an epidemic of hypothyroidism in women. It's causing all the other hormones to get out of whack. And women are going, well, why can't I lose weight? And nobody wants to hear, you can't lose weight because you're staring at a freaking computer screen all day long, every single day, and you've been doing it for the last 10 years. And it's throwing your system out of whack. And it, it's just so hard for women to grasp and to let that sink in. But this is so key because cortisol is one of the number one reasons I see women not being able to lose weight. They can change their diet. They can exercise like crazy. If their cortisol is out of balance, it will make it near impossible for someone to lose weight. And you can meditate and you can do all these amazing things. Meditate. And, you know, and I always recommend that, like, you know, this whole the whole like mind mindfulness and change your state and do all of these things that you can but if your environment isn't connecting isn't giving you the right signals and you're staying in that sympathetic nervous system like you said being energized or no stimulated all day long and not energized we've got a serious problem and i do think too our bodies are so freaking smart that when they what's starting to happen now is we're getting we're, we've been stimulated for so long that your body goes i can't stay in this high sympathetic nervous system state anymore because right. my body's going to fall apart and your body's smart enough to go i'm going to start driving this cortisol down now in order it's not adrenal fatigue it's okay my body's smart and it knows that it should not be staying on this flipped on state for years right. on end, this isn't healthy. So your body starts to drive that cortisol down in order to preserve. But with that comes a lower thyroid, you know, low progesterone, you know, not, you're not able to build muscle. Like there's so many fat around the stomach. Because we're yeah. going to affect our adrenal system. So this is huge, like huge, Scott. <laughs> and you know, it truly is, so yeah. <laughs> well, that's... Um, so you touched on a really interesting point there, and it's, there, it's even that's a bigger conversation that um, sometimes in biology or in medicine, we have this idea of like what Aubrey Marcus um, is called like the faulty machine hypothesis, and that is that, you know, our cortisol is out of whack, therefore our body is broken. It's like, mm, no, we're not smarter than our body, sorry. Yeah. It's that when it's in kind of the wrong stimulus, your body, it's like it responds in kind of a survival mode. So you think about, let's say, people packing on weight. You know, fat cells aren't actually bad. They're... The problem is, is they're supposed to be a motel. You check in and then you leave, you check in and you leave. They're just kind of like a place you hold energy for a little bit. Unfortunately, they become a retirement home. And so our bodies, what they do is they really start to pack on energy because the fact that we're constantly stimulating ourselves, your body goes, holy smokes, the last 10 years I've been constantly stimulated. Maybe I should start packing on some energy because clearly this person driving the boat, driving the bus, isn't providing the, the right energy. So your body takes it upon itself to store that energy. Because you're constantly being stimulated but not being energized, what's your body going to respond? Well, let's store up some energy. Let's store up some resources, right? Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah, and then it gets to a point where your body just almost, in some sense, can't keep up. And like I said, it will kind of start to decline. It's like if we keep running at this, you know, this pace, we're going to crash. Um, and so it's, you know, it's it's not just wounded. It's also men too. It's it's anyone on the planet that's constantly exposed to a stimulating environment. You know, naturally, the hormones, the kind of chemicals, the, the signals in our body. Again, there, there's nothing inherently wrong with necessarily the environment that we're in right now. It's just the fact that our bodies got used to a pretty stable one. You know, even take, for example, with our lungs. It, it's another way that we interact with our environment constantly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for like the six million years, you know, our bodies were breathing air that was recycled by trees. Now we're breathing air that's recycled by, you know, air filters. Like, do you think it's going to be the same? And people don't have to believe what you and I are saying. Just you got to ask yourself, how do you feel when you go to a cottage? Like it's, it's, it's not camping. a trivial thing. If you go camping. Right, go camping. camping. Exactly. 
Yeah, the idea about returning to nature, for a long time it's been kind of plagued as this hippie thing that, you know, uh, I mean, only, only hippies do the whole nature thing. It's like, well, no, we're natural beings, right? That's, that's where we came from. And it's kind of an interesting time because um, it's something that I've been thinking about recently. You know, as humans, it's a, it's a neat thing to build another organism. You know, for example, like we're designing artificial artificial intelligence. Again, that's a misnomer. word. It's sure as hell not artificial intelligence. It's very intelligent. But this, this machine, these computers, these robots that we're building, it's like we're building a life form, and that's really cool. That's, that takes a lot of talent. To me, it's a divine thing, and truly divine, whether you think it's God or nature, to actually design an environment for an organism to thrive. So like, yeah, on a scale from one to 10, it's about a stick to actually you know, design an organism. It's like a 10 out of 10 to actually design an artificial environment where that organism will thrive indefinitely. Because that means you have to account for everything which could possibly take it out if you truly want it to live forever. And right now, you know, we're playing with that game. You know, it's like, you know, for the first time, we're, we're smart enough to break nature's rules. And so we're playing with, you know, designing our own kind of, you know, artificial environment here. And so naturally, there are going to be some consequences. You know, naturally, because we're just so new to this game, it's almost like, you know, think about LEDs, how new those are, or just even indoor lighting. On the span of human evolution, how short amount of time that's been that we've actually been playing with these things, like replacing the sun with the ones that we built. You know, it's like we have to give ourselves a little bit of credit. Like, there's going to be a little bit of, you know, kind of layover time where things aren't going to kind of work right. Our bodies aren't going to know how to adjust. We're not going to know how to deal with these things. Um, so I think there is a level of awareness and respect that kind of should be, um, you know, should be there for kind of what we're trying to do as a society. But, you know, like you talked about with, with some problems with cortisol and weight, it's just simply a problem, um, you know, of, of perhaps things that we haven't accounted for when we're dealing with our bodies. You know, it's not our bodies breaking down. It's our bodies trying to save us while yes. we play this kind of divine game. Yes. But here's an example. So these glasses that I'm wearing right now, they're called blue tech. They're blue tech lenses. So they block uh, about 50% of the blue light that comes from the screen. It lets in a little bit that sets your circadian rhythm, but it blocks the really harmful ones. I have these orange glasses that I wear at night, right? They look goofy as can be. Like, I get it. Like, super funny. And I, I remember when I started wearing them about four years ago now, like, pe people laugh. and thought it was crazy, but, you know, I didn't care because fundamentally what the orange glasses and what these uh, orange glasses block 100% of blue light, these block 50 so it's just one of the ways that you can survive in a modern environment and kind of get the best of it, like watching Netflix, which, you know, I love to do without completely destroying your body, right? There's nothing that's ever going to be, you know, complete darkness in the night, let's face it. But, you know, Black Mirror, I'm just sort of watching, I think they do a fundamentally amazing job of the show. However, at nighttime, I throw on the orange glasses and I block that blue light that's coming in. Um, and even your skin has blue receptors, so you put a blanket on yourself, and you get the best of both worlds. You get the best of being a 21st century human, getting to watch something like that, and you're also taking care of your biology at the same time. Yes, so, and since I yeah. spoke to you last time, Scott, I'll just, I'm very proud of myself. For those that are awesome. listening, you're not going to be able to see this, but I went on and bought myself a pair of the Blue Blocker daytime ones. Wonderful. They look very nice. At my computer screen, I was pretty. I was. I was. I'm impressed. These don't look too bad. Yeah. I bought them offline, oh, awesome. and they were like. Yeah. Uh, I think I paid twenty dollars, twenty five dollars for them. You just give so, them away for free now. Yeah, when I bought these, yeah. it was one hundred and fifty for the lenses, and now you can buy the full on, you know, good looking glasses. Yeah, and glasses. this one came with. They give you a blue flashlight, like with a with the blue light on it, and then this, the, you know, you put a piece of paper behind it and you shine it on just so you can prove to yourself how much it's right. exact. It is blocking, so that's good. I was going to ask you what's the difference between those and then the orange ones. So the orange ones are one hundred percent blocking those ones are just partial block okay right and it, now with blue light too it's um there's some debate about this but it's not a terrible thing to allow a little bit of blue light in right kind of throughout the yeah. day. Um, and that's what i think these glasses are pretty good for but just as a general rule of thumb if possible when the sun goes down that's when you slap on the orange glasses and like trust me it's going to be weird for about a week or two because your reality is going to be orange yeah. But, um, you know, everyone that I, I've worked with, and it's funny, like with my roommate too, when he first saw him on my face, like he thought he was just absolutely like bananas crazy. Um, but you know, he's, he was willing to indulge me and he tried getting a pair and you know, when, when he doesn't wear them, I mean, you talk, like you just realize how bright light is at night. And yeah. you know, I've worked with some other people and they wore the orange glasses and I get the same text like, man, I didn't realize how like stimulating and how crazy bright the light was. And so I started wearing the orange glasses. So yeah, again, I'm going to get some. 
Yeah. That's my perfect. next, I, I'm going to warn my husband that it's going to, I'm going to look a little bit funny now at nighttime because I'm going to have my orange sunglasses on, but I have horrible insomnia. So for me, I know I get very stimulated by the lights and the computer and I try to turn the phone off and have all those things and put the screen lights on there and, or the filters on my phone, but still it doesn't matter. You still can be very stimulated by it. So besides the, the lights, um, I, you know, we're, we're running out of time. I just want a few more of your like, cause you have this kind of you know, we want nutrition. We want to be aware of the visual, right? So the lights, we want, you know, to get sunlight. We want to get that full spectrum light. Um, as, and then lungs, you know, like you said, like get outside. We want to have some fresh air. We don't want to always be breathing in this uh, regurgitated air that's <laughs> in our environment. And, right. and then you had one more there that was uh, the gut, which, or no, that was nutrition. So skin, vision, gut, lungs. So skin would be same thing. Like just we want to make sure we get some sunlight on our skin. Let's make it easy and just like a very kind of broad thing. Um, do your best to live a natural lifestyle as much as possible when possible. That means you get outside in the sun in the morning with your feet on the earth, on the ground. Like in the Jack Cruces, you make like the sphinx. You're good in the earth. You don't stare. You know, don't stare. Not today. It was minus 35 at my house. So <laughs> you know what you can do is, if your hands can manage it, you can grab a tree. That is also grounding. Um, it doesn't have to be your feet, but just grabbing a tree does the same thing. Go go um, hug a tree. Become a tree hugger. Honestly, you look goofy, but when you start actually noticing what it does to your body, it's like it's I've heard. Day. Yeah. Yeah. And so just it's very simple. You know, want to get as get as much sun as you possibly can. Don't, I mean, no sunglasses, no sunscreen. Like, you don't get enough sun to kind of warrant that blocking. Um, so just get outside as much as possible in the sun, breathing that natural air. When it comes to nighttime and there's, you know, when the sun's the sunset and it's meant to be dark, you know, cover your body so you're blocking your skin from absorbing the stimulating light. Cover your eyes with the orange glasses. Um, if there's two other things I can pass on when it comes to meditation, I would recommend everyone you know, meditate. And I'm not specific about what type to do, but Again, understanding the balance in our life with the stress and the turning off kind of thing. So learning how to kind of, it's an awareness tool and then also how to just calm your body and let it do what it does best. Fundamentally important. And when it comes to every single system in your body, this is perhaps a conversation for another day, but the reason you feel good when you meditate is because every single system in your body becomes optimized. For any biology lovers out there, um, I'd recommend looking into vagal nerve stimulation and cardiac outcomes, but it does do mitochondria. Um, and the last but not least is cold. And so I can pass on one thing. When you're in the shower, just flip back cold and hot for as long as you can, uh, as cold as you can. And, you know, when, especially when it comes to hormones and fixing things like that, what you force your body to do is become a really energy efficient machine. The reason cold feels so terrible is because it feels like immediate death because your body literally will die if it doesn't get warm. So it either has to die or it figures out a way to kind of create heat really well. That means it creates energy really well. So you can imagine your body's a smart system. If it's going to create heat and energy really well, the other systems like your hormones will have to optimize for that to happen. So do your best to get morning sun, you know, afternoon sun, block late at night, you know, find ways to calm yourself up about playing with food, whether that's meditation, you know, whether that's just having a really good conversation with someone that you love. Um, and then, yeah, when you're in the shower, maybe go cold hot. And just very simple kind of, you know, easy things to incorporate, but I think you're going to have a really profound impact. I think so too. And there's, I can put the link in the show notes, but the van, is it called the Van Hoff method or something Hoff? Wim Hoff. Yeah. W-I-M-H-O-F. Yeah. That dude's a rabbit hole. And in my opinion, and I know this is a bold statement, but the most important um, person in health today, uh, just recently in a neuroscience um, journal, which is very prestigious. Mm -hmm. There is an article published called, I believe it's called Brain Over Body. And he showed that um, kind of consciously he can control his body and he can teach other people how to do this too. So that just blows our whole paradigm of kind of biology out of the water. Um, and again, this is not woo-woo. This is published in mm -hmm. neuroscience journals. So you know, yeah, and you can watch his a YouTube video. I'll link to it in the show notes, but the YouTube video, even just watch it. It's so like, um, it's amazing what this man is, has been doing. And I mean, there's people that have cured right. their cancer and cured their autoimmune conditions. And it's simply what Scott here is talking about, about cold therapy and get, bringing your body temperature to a very, very cold. Uh, to me, I'm just like, oh, I just shudder watching it. I can't do it. He said that at one point yeah. in the show, yeah. he says how his 
eyes froze when he was doing it once. Like yeah, the, he was swimming in the arc circle and yes. set a record, but his retinas froze. So, his retinas froze. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, There's, I can't do that. <laughs> but yeah, but just simply the cold and hot. And you can get, there's a lot of places I know like spa treatments and stuff like that that now offer cryotherapy, which is the really, really cold. And and, and the list- You, you don't need it, just go in a cold amazing. shower. Like, just go in the cold right. shower, yeah. Yeah, again, we don't need to get too technical about skin temperature and stuff, just- if you can freeze your ass off for a little bit at a time, you're going to have profound pain. Yeah, yeah. I was just down watching Tony Robbins, and he gets every single morning, he does a cold plunge. He's built them into his house, so he goes outside, he jumps into his cold <laughs> plunge, and, and yeah. that's the way he wakes his body up and puts himself into that you know great state that the guy's always mm -hmm. in. <laughs> but yeah. you know, it's yeah. pretty cool, though, and I really think that these little – tips they're they're not that hard like these are really easy things to implement you know to the simply the even just the glasses buy yourself a cup you know spend the thirty dollars on a couple pairs of glasses and you're going to start to regulate your system you're going to start to normalize those cortisol levels and in turn ladies you're going to help the hormonal system in your body to lose weight and this is uh, a a like a secret weapon. I really believe that this is a secret weapon for optimizing your health and optimizing your weight loss results. So this has been awesome, Scott. I really appreciate it. And I hope that our listeners got as much from it that I did. I'm sure they will. So thank you so much. And we can find you at, what's your website again? Uh, MyNLPT.com slash daily optimization. Um, to be completely honest, if people are interested in some of my ideas, um, just, you know, have them contact me. I believe it is to kind of through that website and like truly I'm just happy to help with anything that I possibly can. You know, yeah, because no your course really looks great. Good. The daily optimization, just these simple tools to optimize your daily, like just to optimize your health, period, I think is, and you're right, it's this yeah. amazing holistic view of what needs to be in play in order for us to optimize our health. So thanks so much right. for being on the show, and I think we'll probably have you back again. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it.